That is yeah. one. Okay. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on uh, retaining walls in Optum G2. This is a really interesting application. It's a lot of, uh, I guess, your everyday problems involves retaining walls. And with Optum G2, we'll show you or demonstrate how easily you can solve these problems with retaining walls using Optum G2. So I think you'll find today's webinar extremely interesting. Again, as last time, the presentation is 30 minutes, and we'll follow this by a Q&A session also, 30 minutes or, or whatever duration is needed. So uh, at, at a complete session of 60 minutes. The whole session is recorded and will be sent to you, distributed to you with an email. Our uh, presenter today is again, Professor Christian Krabenhoft, of course, also founder, co-founder of Optum and partner in Optum. So Christian, please uh, go ahead and start the presentation. Yes, uh, thank you, Jan. And um, the topic is retaining walls. And I have a, uh, just a brief outline of the, press, of the, let's say, the webinar here, introduction. Then I am going to say something on stability, which is kind of key to these uh, problems. Seismic loading, which is sometimes important, horizontal support systems, anchors, props, that kind of thing, water pressures and seepage, and then a few words on deformation analysis uh, towards the end. But just to sort of introduce with a few pictures what we are talking about, retaining walls come in all kinds of shapes and sizes of, and of a variety of materials. Mass construction gravity walls uh, like that one, Reinforced concrete walls with and without moment relief platforms. That's kind of a nice thing to build in to basically relieve the earth pressure on the wall, uh, at least horizontally. Uh, crib walls, gabion walls, so basically steel mesh cages filled with some sort of rock material to basically form building blocks uh, for the wall. Sheep pile walls. Um, anchored sheet pile walls as shown here and here and um, diaphragm walls with these supports in the form of rakes as they're called second pile walls um, that are as, as I think everyone knows created in this kind of way by drilling these primary piles and then driving secondary piles so there's various types of, of support systems as well um, helical anchors Grouted anchors are very common, and uh, these props with some sort of hydraulic system to basically adjust um, to push the wall into the soil again if it pops out too far. Um, here are some examples of that, and they can be put in at several levels as well. So a wide variety of, of scenarios that can actually all be modeled in Optum G2. So, but before we start with that, I, I just wanted to say a few words on stability and it's much the same as I said <clears throat> in the last webinar on slope stability. So this is really not too different from slope stability, these types of retaining structures, at least as far as, as stability goes. And there's of course also the issue with deformations that, that we'll get to. But um, to start with, I think it's important to uh, know the factor of safety and um, yeah, as I mentioned last time, there's many different definitions of the factor of safety, but they all have one thing in common, uh, namely that a factor of safety greater than one indicates stability, less than one instability, and a factor of safety equal to one, well, that uh, signifies that you're right on the boundary between stability and instability. So for a stable system, we have some stresses in the ground and in the wall as well, for that matter, uh, and these stresses satisfy the equilibrium equations and the failure criteria and your more Coulomb or your Tresca or Hope Brown or whatever you have. So um, the question is then how stable is this stable system? What is the factor of safety? And to answer that question, we ask another question, namely by what amount should the material strength be reduced to induce a state of collapse to bring the system right to the boundary between stability and instability? And if we talk more Coulomb, well, the material strengths are the cohesion and the friction angle. So we should reduce those to bring about a state of collapse, except that we usually do, we usually do, and we do the same, uh, is reduce not, is reduce C and 
not five, but 10 phi by some number. And this uh, number, um, the number that brings the system to an uh, uh, just unstable state is uh, our, uh, our factor of safety. So um, in Optum G2, it's called strength reduction analysis. We are, you're looking for this critical strength reduction factor, which is then the factor of safety. So I thought to start with, I would um, I'll just show how this works for a, for a structure that looks kind of like this, a, a gravity wall. And so I'm going to switch to Optum. And I have to say, uh, I wasn't planning on giving a really a, a very thorough introduction to the program. And I'm still not planning to do that um, because uh, then it'll take more than half an hour, I think. I went through some of the features last time, uh, but for a more complete introduction to the program, I can uh, recommend our, uh, oh, our YouTube channel. So go to YouTube and search for Optum Computational Engineering. There is a video called YouTube uh, Optum G2 The Basics. That's a, a good video. It's actually included in the program as well. So once you download and install the program, you will have this video on your welcome screen. You can either choose to, to play it or not, but it's available on YouTube as well, along with a lot of other videos. And if you also, I should make a bit of advertisement for myself. If you go to my personal YouTube channel, so search for my name and you will find uh, 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 various videos as well that could be useful, including another introduction and, and so on. So there's, oh, uh, there's a lot of, um, of these types of resources available online. Um, there's the manuals as well that come with the program. So, so, so I will, uh, I'll, I'll get started on, on this actual problem here and draw, try to draw this uh, kind of a gravity wall. Let's say something like, like this and maybe something like like that and so this is now my my wall and then the soil and i'm gonna have sort of a sloping ground here at the back say something like that and it's just sort of freehand drawing now so um, just to illustrate the basic the basic concepts how, how it works um, and then back to here. And um, I think, did I put two points? Yeah, sometimes that happens and then you want to just delete that. So, um, so that's my geometry and then I'm going for the wall. I'm going to use a rigid material. So that's a material that has infinite strength, infinite stiffness. So if it's concrete, of course, concrete has both infinite, uh, finite strength and stiffness, but compared to those of the soil, it's, it's, they're very large unit weight of 25, say, and then uh, uh, for the sand, uh, for, for the soil, well, the sand, yeah, MC, this MC sand, a predefined material with a friction angle of 35 degrees, a unit weight of, of 16. And I think I just want to make this edge here, move that, make that slightly, slightly deeper, um, say like that. Good. So, um, <clears throat> So that's, that is my geometry then. And then I move to features, my geometry materials and features, standard fixities, first of all, to just support this um, uh, at the bottom and, and, and at the sides. And then I'm basically ready to run my strength reduction analysis. And I go to the uh, stage manager and I then select strength reduction. And then some settings come up down here. And the important settings are the element type and then the number of elements. So the number of elements, let's say, let's take 1000 and then the element type. So there's various elements available. There's two, the two first ones are called lower and upper. And um, those elements are associated with what's really a unique feature in Optum G2 that I'm not aware that any other program has available this feature. So what, I'm, what we're going to do now is calculate uh, an approximate solution like you would do with your conventional FE like you would do with limit equilibrium, except we know that in conventional FE and in limit equilibrium, we don't know how good this approximate solution is. In FE, well, we think that if we increase the number of elements, then somehow we gradually approach the solution. That's of course what should happen, but we still don't know really how accurate our solution is. What we have in Optum is the possibility to calculate not just one accurate, one approximate solution, but an upper bound and a lower bound. 
in the sense that we calculate a lower bound, a solution that is guaranteed to be conservative. And then we can calculate an upper bound that is guaranteed to be unconservative. So instead of calculating one um, approximate solution, we're actually calculating an interval in which we can guarantee that the true solution lies. So I'm going to switch here to upper in this second stage. So I have two stages, let's call it LB, lower bound and upper bound, and then basically just run the analysis. And so this is the lower bound. This is a good factor of safety. It's sort of above two, 2.09. And uh, so I know that my factor of safety is not smaller than 2.09. Uh, that's, and it's not higher than it's not greater than 2.33. So I have this interval now where I know that the exact solution is somewhere in between. Uh, I can plot the strain, so epsilon one minus epsilon three, uh, so some kind of shear strain, and that looks like this, and I can play this kind of little movie, and that looks, uh, I think, uh, quite, um, quite credible. Then another thing to, 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 to bracket the, uh, basically to increase the accuracy, is to, you can use more elements as in conventional FE, but you can also use mesh adaptivity. And what I mean by this, we'll say, we'll say yes. What I mean by this is, instead of using just a, a, a uniform mesh as I've done here, why not try to adapt the mesh to the solution? So that's what mesh adaptivity is all about. And um, the way it works is that you start with a certain number of elements, the default value is 1000, we'll go with that. And then there's a number of iterations. So you start with a thousand elements and calculate a solution. This is actually what I've just done. That's the first iteration. Then you adapt the mesh. That's the second iteration. And you do that one more time. That's the third iteration. And you do that so that you start with a thousand elements and you end up with a, a predefined number as well. Let's say 2000. So we work our way from 1000 to 2000 in the course of three iterations. And we can do the same with the lower bound and then uh, let's just make a note. So it was 2.09 and 2.33. And then um, <clears throat> the upper bound should come down and the lower bound should come up. And in this way, the gap between the two uh, will be narrowed. And so this is what we had before 2.09. And then it's the second iteration. It's, it's slightly better. And the third iteration, even better. Um, so the lower bound now goes to 2.13. So not a huge improvement, but um, maybe the original solution was actually pretty good. It, something indicates that since the gap already between the upper and lower bounds was not very large. And the upper bound from 2.32 to, uh, we are now down to 2.2. So the gap has been narrowed. And you can see if we look at the strain, the strains have become a lot more localized. You can see sort of more a more clearly defined failure mechanism. And that's because the mesh has been adapted. The elements have been put, let's say, where you need them. So this is a really useful and, and uh, actually quite unique feature. So just to summarize what we did, we plot the factor of safety versus, I call it the mesh quality here. So um, the mesh quality covers both the number of elements and also how you place the elements. So in, in these three iterations, the mesh quality definitely improved. Um, and we then started with an upper bound and a lower bound. They were some distance apart. First iteration uh, and then the second iteration, they came closer together, third even closer. And as we, if we had continued, we would have eventually, and um, quite soon actually, got to the exact solution. So this is a great way of of, of obtaining a, 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 a quantitative estimate of how good your solution actually is. And of course, the lower bounds have a, have, have a special uh, attraction in themselves in that you can guarantee that, the, uh, that they're conservative. How conservative they are, you can find that out by calculating the corresponding upper bound. Seismic loading, and the reason I wanted to just say a few words about that is that it came up in the, our webinar last time with slope stability. And it's, it's relevant for slope stability, but also for very much for retaining walls. And um, well, it's illustrated here actually with respect to a, to a slope and it's the so-called pseudo-static approach that I'll be uh, demonstrating. 
So the idea is you have uh, some structure, in this case, it's a retaining wall, and then you have an earthquake come by, so you have some ground accelerations, and those ground accelerations um, uh, uh, give rise to uh, additional body forces in the soil, forces in addition to those stemming from unit weight. And that can both be a vertical one and a horizontal one. Usually it's the horizontal one that, that's the interesting and that's specified as a, uh, by, by this KH, uh, the horizontal seismic coefficient. So this is, um, indicates what fraction of the unit weight is applied horizontally. And that of course would always decrease the uh, factor of safety. Some indications of the typical values of, 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 of this horizontal seismic coefficient 0.05 to 0.15 in the United States, somewhat larger in Japan. Tazaki says 0.1 is a severe earthquake, 0.2 is a violent destructive one, and 0 .3, 0 0.5 is a, is a catastrophic one. So, so um, why don't we try to do a violent destructive earthquake and that is then a horizontal body force of 0.2 times the unit weight. And that can be applied, that should be applied, of course, I'm going to just copy this, and that should be applied both to the wall and to the soil, of course, everywhere. Uh, and you can see that you can either apply, you can either specify these forces in terms of actual force or in terms of acceleration, in terms of, of multiples of, of g. And we had point, point 0.2, uh, and that's a uh, um, right to left in this case is of course the, the critical the critical situation and um and i would then uh, i will then rerun it and now yeah well our our factor of safety before it was uh somewhat greater than two and now we are sort of heading to a value below i think 1.5 uh, 1.45 or so it looks like 1.48 and the failure mechanism, it's, as far as I can see, it's kind of similar to what we had before in just the, the you can say the static case. It's, it has a somewhat greater extent. I should have maybe extended this boundary a little bit, but um, it is similar to what we had uh, before. Static, uh, seismic. So that's, that, those types of analysis that are easy to, to carry out then uh, horizontal support systems, and I really wanted to sort of just go through a few of the options with respect to, to sheep pile walls of this type here, where we have a row of anchors, looks like grouted anchors up here. And the way to model this type of wall is, of course, to, to consider a section of the wall. We have a section of the wall and then some sort of uh, horizontal support. So if I was to just create a new stage and then draw up a something like a sheet pile wall, um, say like that. And then uh, let's say that's yeah, sand. And then I'm going to put in a wall already via a so-called plate element. And let's make that um, something like that. Uh, and um, then have maybe something like that. So this is now eight meters and this is, this is three meters. Now the wall element or the plate element is, is it's, an, it's an elastoplastic element. The elasticity is not really important when it comes to the, um, to the strength reduction here. It's only the yield moment really that, that matters and that's the default value is, is 800 kilonewton meter per meter. You can of course change that. The weight, 150, is probably all right as well. And then there's these interface reduction factors. So you can see the plus and minus here. That refers to the interfaces between the wall and the soil. And they come automatically with these elements. So if I click this, well, I can change the material at the interface. I can have a brand new material at the interface. Or I can apply a reduction factor. And if we're talking more Coulomb, this reduction factor is applied to the friction angle. And two thirds is something that um, you see used quite a bit. It's recommended also in Eurocode 7. And um, should we begin doing strength reduction? And we then just have the standard fixities and then some sort of horizontal support. And 
the simplest form of horizontal support is simply just a, a, a beam or a plate support. This We call it the plate BC. Um, so it's just sort of a fixed support like that. So this is a rigid support and you would then do your analysis. You would find out what forces are in this rigid support and then you design your, your structure accordingly. We can do something slightly more elaborate though. We could say that uh, we had a, um, we remove that, we had, we wanted to sort of model the, the a grouted anchor and we could do that in a, you could say a primitive way by, say we have a, a rod here of 10 meters and we want to have, give that an inclination of, uh, let's say something like 20 degrees. So say minus 20, like that. And then the grout, we could again, just say the grout is just a, a, a rigid support. Of course, not how grout is in the real world, but, but um, it's somehow better than nothing. And so this, this connector here, we call it, um, is, is a, you could say, a, actually kind of a spring element that does not interact with the soil. Uh, it just connects the wall to this rigid support down here. And there is an alternative way, actually, instead of drawing this line and, and so on, you can use what is called a fixed end anchor. So a fixed end anchor is this whole connector and the support in one, uh, at one point. So it's kind of a, a point spring with some effective properties. Uh, the yield force, I forgot to say that, but these are again, elastoplastic elements. The yield force here is, a, is 300 uh, kilonewtons. And then there is a spacing and that spacing refers to, to this spacing here between the anchors. Let's just leave that at, at one meter. Uh, and this whole thing can be basically put into a point by this fixed end anchor where you can where you can supply the spacing again, the equivalent length which was 10 meters, and then the inclination angle which was 20 degrees. So these two stages are equivalent. You could also go into more detail and actually uh, instead of um, instead of having this rigid support here here, somehow try to account for the grout. What we recommend is this nail row, which is kind of a kind of an element with a with a finite finite strength. Um, so, um, and if this was three hundred, I want higher strength in in, in the grout. So say five hundred, and also laterally. So so different ways of of modeling the same thing. Uh, and I should I wanted to have have upper here. Should have done that start with. Uh, so basically four different ways of, of modeling an anchor and they're going to be uh, they're going to be fairly similar. Uh, these two are going to be completely equivalent and I think this one is not going to differ that much but let's see. The rigid support can of course take whatever force is, is required. So uh, yeah, if we have a finite strength anchor, well, the factor of safety is a little less. And um, the one with the, with the grout, actual grout is, is, yeah, it's very similar. So one point is actually a, a, a identical in this case. So, um, so there's various options for, for modeling this and you can see this is how it fails. Uh, let's try to plot some, some, some strains. And maybe there is a bit of straining around the, around the grout here. Yes, it, it seems so. That we, of course, don't have in, in this case or in, in this case. Um, but it turns out that the factor of safety is, is really quite insensitive to that little detail. Um, okay, so, so final thing um, that I wanted to say with these sheet pile walls has to do with, with water pressures and seepage. So, um, so suppose that we model it like this, which in many cases is my preferred way with a fixed end anchor. And suppose that we have a water table, which is here at the ground surface. Say this is a rainy area. And suppose that the water table down here is at the, at, is at the base of the excavation as well. Then of course we have a seepage around the sheet pile wall and uh, the seepage is going to change the effective unit weight and it's also of course going to induce some uh, uh, pressures on the wall. How much, uh, well, 
what 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 you just have to do is 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 basically set things up that is of course difficult enough but as soon as you have these flow bcs imposed a seepage analysis is going to be run behind the scenes automatically you can say it says running seepage analysis that calculates the pore pressures and the pore pressures that are then used are then used in the subsequent mechanical analysis in this case the strength reduction analysis and you can see we've gone from a factor of safety of 1. Point, what was it 78 to point uh, to less than 1.92, so so it ha it's had a huge effect the water pressure in this case, and we can we can plot um, the water pressure. It looks something like that. I forgot to mention, of course, we can also you would want to plot also the bending moment uh, in in the in the wall that looks like this, and just compare this value 351 to the capacity of the wall, which was 800. So. Um, all the results are, are available. If you click them, um, you ca they come up over here. The actual numbers come up over here. You can export them as well to an Excel sheet. So, so um, all the results are available. If, but if we look at the, at the water pressures, we'll see this sort of, it's not exactly a linear distribution. It sort of tapers off a bit at the end. And if you actually look at the numbers, you will see that this value uh, that we have, the maximum value is somewhat less than corresponding to hydrostatic Conditions. So this seepage means that the water pressure on the active side decreases, and on the uh, on the uh, passive side, well, we have we have um, something like this. It, it the maximum value is slightly greater than what we would have with hydrostatic conditions, starting from this point here. Also, uh, so that's of course that's those water pressures are taken into account when doing the strength reduction analysis. And what's also taken into account is the change in unit weight or in effective unit weight that we have as a result of this seepage. So if I if I show you this, this probably looks more familiar. We have we have a we have a seepage around um, here around the the tip of the wall, and that means that we have some hydraulic gradients which changes the effective unit weight. And in the way as shown here, so this effective unit weight might actually be, uh, well, on, on, on the active side, it, it increases compared to what we would have with a standard effective unit weight. And on the passive side, it decreases. You can see it even becomes zero. Um, uh, it's not zero up here. If it had become zero here at the surface, then that would correspond to, to, to boiling. Right. So, um, so all of these things are taken into account automatically it is of course so so um, it is of course a bit of an issue this whole thing with water pressures and there's lots of guidelines and it's sometimes in the codes as well uh, what exact water pressures should you actually use uh, here's from the Syria guidance on embedded retaining wall design which is I think widely used depending on exactly how the situation is is it homogeneous and isotropic soil then, well, it's, it's actually something exactly as shown here. Is there anisotropy? Is it a high permeability over low permeability and so on? All of that affects not only the net pressures, water pressures on the wall, but also the hydraulic gradients and thereby the effective unit weight. So you can, if you want to do sort of a, 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 a semi-manual uh, analysis, you can, of course, do that in an effective stress framework um, so use the appropriate unit weights and then apply the pressures as as a fixed um, distributed forces uh, similar to actually what we did with the with the with the seismic uh, loading so so that can be done it can be done in various ways and either sort of by <clears throat> by specified distributions or if you want sort of a more um, have a more Sort of something that's more in line with the actual physics of the problem, then you can do an actual seepage analysis. Um, good. And then finally, deformation analysis. And I won't go into details about it. I'll just say that there's probably a question now that um, what about deformations? So suppose that I had done this problem here, sort of a braced excavation, and I'd come up with a factor of safety of one point five and upper lower bounds close together and then the question would be what about the what are the deformations what about deformations and and the answer to that question is really um the deformations that you have in this final state here um the question is how this final state has come about right so if it's an excavation we would we could have started like this with the piles driven in 
and then excavated uh, in the course of a number of stages. Maybe we had inserted the, the prop at this stage and, and pre-stressed it and then excavated some more. So if that had been the case, and that's what I have set up in, in Optum, then you would have deformations in each of these stages that look something like this. So to start with, and then there's some, some heave, then further down the, the wall start to sort of bend into the excavation. Then the prop with preloading pushes the walls away and then some further excavation. So the final deformations we have in this case are of course the sum of the deformations that we incur with, within uh, or in each of these stages. And in this case, it looks something like this. And I have seemed to have applied too much pre-stress here. Right? I could have done with less if I had wanted the walls to be, to be just more or less straight. Um, so, so yeah, that the deformations need to be need to be accounted for by basically accounting for all the different stages that led to this final stage that you're now conducting your factor of safety analysis with respect to, and that can be done in Optum G2, requires an elastoplastic analysis and a sequence of linked stages, but it's quite easy to do. And we will have a, a webinar announced shortly on this problem of excavations. So, uh, and yeah, here are the deformations again. So that's what I wanted to say. Also, final thing is uh, we have our web page, of course, Optum CE. You can download, if you go to the download tab here, you can download the program uh, here. And then also you need, a, um, you need a trial license to run it if you don't already have one. So um, that's it for me. Thanks a lot, Christian. Very interesting. Um... We have a couple of questions, and actually, I was uh, you. I have I have a question myself actually because. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So we ha have a couple of questions, and, and and I also have a couple of questions because um, we 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 discussed something yesterday that you didn't show today. So I, I uh, but 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 let's take one thing at a time. There is, this, there is a guy who's asking, how does a program find the upper and lower bound? So what one thing is, how does the program do it? And the, another thing is, how, how can you be sure that it is an upper and lower bound? Yeah, well, I mean, this is, it comes, that is, can sort of be proven, let's say, mathematically. Uh, it's the upper and lower bound theorems of, of classic plasticity. So lower bound solutions involve the um, identification of a statically admissible stress field. So a stress field that's in equilibrium and satisfies the failure criterion. And uh, the uh, upper bound involves sort of more, uh, you postulate a mechanism, calculate internal work, external work, and then you um, equate the two. And in that way, you can work out an estimate of, of the upper bound. So so this is a way, uh, this is a kind of a modern take on two methods, the upper and lower bound methods of plasticity that are, uh, that are really quite old. And um, okay, they, so are, they are now done with respect to, to a finite element mesh, right? So, and eventually the two theorems lead to optimization problems. And these optimization problems are what is, is solved uh, in, in Optum. So you can be a hundred percent sure that it is a lower bound and an upper bound when using the Optum G2? Absolutely. Okay, and what, what are the restrictions on using the, I mean, the, 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 there are certain restrictions, right? Uh, no, there are no restrictions. Well, there is a, the, I mean, unless there are bugs in the program, then then there will be upper and lower bounds, so. Uh, okay, but Okay, so I, I don't think there are bugs in the program. No, but I'm thinking about the flow rule, for example. Yeah, uh, but that's not an issue. I don't think we should discuss here. No. Okay. Um, so okay. Um, that's a question that is can be uh, uh, that can be uh, addressed in at another time. Yeah. But um, okay, so uh, the the. What, what we were talking about yesterday was the Gabian walls. Yes, I actually, yeah, I didn't have time to show it, but the, 
the little story with that Gabion wall is that we did this Gabion wall some time ago, and it had a fairly complex geometry. That in principle could have been modeled with, with Optum G2, but it was done in, uh, in AutoCAD instead, and then we ended up with a, with a DXF file. Um, and you can actually import such a DXF file into, uh, into Optum. It's called Gabion wall here. And uh, import this into a, to a new stage. And um, here is the geometry here. Here's the, here's the, the blocks. And uh, there's two soil layers. And I have a, um, I have a, uh, let me just save this in case we need it again. I ran this problem then, and let me just see where it is. Um, so, so that's, that's this one here. And this is, this is the failure. Um, so it looks like this. And um, this material up here is a sand friction angle of 40 degrees. And uh, here we have a, it's a kind of a, supposed to be a kind of clay material. And here we have the blocks unit weights of, of 20. And we have these frictional interfaces in between uh, with, a, with a friction angle of, of 30 degrees. So, um, so, so, so in, in this case, it turns out to look more like a slope instability, of course, but uh, if the wall hadn't been especially up here, this sand would, of course, of course have just come, come tumbling down. So, so yeah, it, it is a, a retaining wall uh, problem, I think you can say. Um, then there was another question, and that was... Um, And then, uh, no, yeah, let's take them one at a time. So there's a, there's, a question, there's a question with how do we determine the necessary wall length for a sheet pile wall? The way I would do that, it does, does, the way I would do that is, is as follows. So let's actually open this webinar again uh, where I had this sheet pile wall and let's take the case uh, without take this case here. So the way I would do that is I would set the problem up and then I would, you can sort of do it in, 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 in a number of different ways. Um, you'd set this wall, make this wall rigid and then uh, make, make this wall rigid. So now the anchor is not going to fail because that's just a rigid support and the wall is not going to fail because that's very rigid. That's a rigid plate as well. And then you could, uh, I think that's what I did uh, in this paper that you're referring to, apply a moment about the wall here. I'm not completely sure that's what, what, what was done. Um, but a moment about the wall that if this moment, uh, and then find basically what is the limit load with respect to this moment, by what number should I multiply this moment to be at failure? So if this is a positive number, I need to drive the wall to failure. If it's a negative uh, number, then I need to uh, resist, um, I need to, to, to uh, apply a, a moment in the opposite direction, basically to be right at the point of stability and instability. And let's, uh, let's yes, just use other. So now I, I know because the factor of safety is greater than one here, I know that this is gonna be a positive number now. Yeah, this of course doesn't run. So where was it? Here. So uh, load multiplier 3,873 and it sort of looks like this. And then basically iteratively, I can start adjusting the length of the wall. Now I'm, I'm, I, this definitely looks as if it's, it's probably gonna be, well, it's still positive, that's uh, kind of surprises me. that uh, 
surprises me. Let me just see what is this? What is the strength reduction factor here? Oh, it's, it's you can do that, of course, as well. Do repeated strength reduction. Um, so maybe this wasn't a very good example because it turns out that the necessary length there is, is really very short. Um, let's do limit analysis. Yeah, finally, I got a negative one. So the critical length is somewhere in between this and this, it seems. So um, that's really not a lot. And so, so, so that's, I, I don't know if that answers your question. You want to have a rigid wall with a rigid support that has a factor of safety equal to one. And you obtain that by iteratively adjusting the length of the wall. Uh, I think. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And I'm really surprised about this. Um, very, very, very small. It's, it's bigger than this, but not not really very much. Uh, so I'm basically doing what I said was necessary here. So. Yeah, so it's somewhere in between this and what I had, what I had before. What if uh, you add and, the adaptivity? And then, yeah, adaptivity. Then it's 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 going to be less, of course, uh, because I'm doing upper bounds here. So uh, then probably it's going to go from something positive to something negative. Yeah. So maybe it was just a question of the mesh being being just a bit too coarse. Yeah, so so that takes a little bit of 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 of, of playing around with, um, but it's okay. Um, then there's a question that if we want to design a sheet pile wall and take the final forces in the structural elements, should I do elastoplastic analysis or strength reduction? If the strength reduction, should we choose soil or structs reduction? Yeah, that's a good question. For the first, that's actually two questions, but for the first part of the question, if you're designing it definitely according to Eurocode 7, there's two, there's two states to be considered, the ultimate limit state and the uh, serviceability limit state. So the ultimate limit state you need to make sure that the structure is stable, that the system is stable uh, with in this fictitious state that the limit state is where you have reduced the material parameters by the partial factors and increased the loads potentially uh, as well. So that's the first thing to be taken care of. And then of course the serviceability conditions need to be met as well. And if it's an excavation we are talking about, well then I would think that should be taken into account by actually conducting an excavation analysis and accounting for all the different steps um, that go into to such an to, to, to such a, an excavation, and then um, uh, making sure that the deformations are not greater than um, greater than what is uh, allowed. So, but for the second part of the question, should it be strength reduction in solids or structs? I didn't say anything about that, but um, let me just sort of then introduce what uh, the what the what the question is really all about, and let me do that. Let me just instead of having this here, let me just instead put a plate uh, BC because then it's sort of more easy to to explain. Um, so let's do a strength reduction. You can see here there's there's a setting here: reduce strength in solids. That means reduce strength in the soil. Uh, and then there's another option, structs. So solids means the soil elements, that's these elements here, and structs refers to everything that's not solid elements, structural elements, both walls and, and anchors and so on. 
So, so I can do a, um, I can do a, a, a strength reduction analysis with respect to solids, the one I, I just did, and I come up with a factor of safety of, of 1.875. And suppose that this 35 degrees is actually my design friction angle has already been factored. Then definitely I'm, I'm, everything is, is good because, um, because I just need to be above one. And then if I look at the results, the question is then, what is my necessary moment? And if I look at the results, well, my maximum moment is, is uh, 365, let's say. So that's definitely enough moment to basically uh, make this design satisfy all, all the requirements. You can see the failure is like this. But the question is, could we somehow reduce this moment? What is the lowest possible moment we can, we can, um, we can work with? And that is a question of, of strength reduction in structs. So leave the soil elements as they are. They've already been factored. We have the design friction angle now. And then I'm asking, by what amount can we reduce this original uh, yield moment or this we call reference yield moment of 800 kilonewton meter per meter. And um, that can be reduced pretty substantially. Remember before we had a maximum moment of 365 and, but by reducing, by optimizing, you could say the yield moment, we will get to a a much smaller moment, uh, and you can 27. I mean, again, I think that sounds a bit, bit low, but, and the wall now fails uh, in this way here. So both of these solutions are, are feasible, but one has a much smaller moment than the other. So, so that's, that's sort of, I would, that's the kind of approach I would use. And once I've then selected my, profile, then I would do the SLS. So, um, so yeah, I hope that, that that answers your question. Then there's a question on uh, MSE walls, so mechanically stabilized earth walls, and I was actually planning to say something about that as well. So there is a, um, there is a uh, Example in the examples manual. So we have this, these manuals here. The examples manuals contains a, a, a total of 60, uh, no, 70 examples. And um, the input files that go with the examples are included in the program as well. They're up here under examples. So example 64 was a, a I call it a, a reinforced soil retaining uh, wall. And it looks like this. And the idea in this example was to look at first the base situation here where we have a wall of comprising these blocks again with interfaces uh, in between. And then we have a, a sand. Uh, and then what is the factor of safety? And what is the factor of safety as compared to the case where we have some sort of reinforcement in the form of geogrids here. So geogrids are say infinitely thin sheets of, of material in this case in, in Optum. Uh, and, uh, and they have a yield strength in tension, yield strength in compression zero. And there is also a, the possibility to reduce the strength here at the geogrid soil interfaces. I've used 0.85 here. So the question is, what is the effect of this geogrid and what is the effect of the length um, that, the, that the geogrid extend in, extends into the soil? And so that was what was, was, was investigated here. And I reran this example uh, uh, just prior to this, to this webinar. And so this is without any reinforcement, without any geogrids. And we see a kind of, I think, memory serves me. Then we see a kind of an, an overturning of this wall like that. And if geogrids are then included, well, then things um, look very different. The failure mechanism looks very different. Factor of safety 1.43 versus I think here we were, yeah, even below 1.98. So it has a, has a fairly massive effect, these, these um, 
these geogrids. And we looked at, in the, you, can, you can look at the example, we looked at the effect of uh, the factor of, of the geogrid length and the factor of safety, both for the uh, non-seismic case, which was the one I showed you here, and then also we included some seismic loading via the pseudo-static approach. And that, of course, reduces the factor of safety. And we also, interestingly, I think, um, identified various sort of modes of failure, overturning for very short lengths, oh, so this, that's this kind of thing, then more of a sliding failure where the geogrids are actually kind of being pulled out of the soil for intermediate lengths, and then for very large lengths, it's more of a, like a global uh, type, um, slope stability type failure. So, um, so yes, these mechanically stabilized earth walls can, can very much be modeled, and, and I think um, all, the, all the tools uh, that are necessary for, for modeling them um, are available, and of course, this kind of problem can be combined with, yeah, in this case, it's already with seismic loading with, with water pressures as well, and with, um, well, if you want surcharge loading up here, whatever, right? So. Modeling in, in Optum G2 is like modeling in, in any finite element uh, program. There's no real limitations in that regard, uh, other than what we have sort of, um, other than what is limited by, by our imagination. So, so that is how it is. Let me just see. Um, Okay, so back to the previous question. When optimizing the plate by reducing the strength in struts, wouldn't it also change the anchor force as the system is now different from before? Um, in, in the way I did it here. Yes, that's very true. So for a, a, a retaining wall with a single anchor or a sheet pile wall with a single anchor, as I showed you here, there's a huge number of different solutions. So suppose you're at some embedment depth, then you in principle have an infinite number of combinations of anchor strength and wall moment that are admissible. Uh, in the sense that if you decrease the wall moment, well then you would typically increase the necessary anchor force. Conversely, if you uh, go for a very um, small anchor force, well that will typically mean that the moment will increase. Um, the necessary moment will increase. So there is a price to pay, right? And you can, should you have uh, the smallest possible moment, and that gives a very large anchor force, or should you have the largest possible anchor force, which um, goes with a, with a small moment, uh, or should you have something in between? So you can actually investigate everything in between uh, using this program. And um, now this, this, this paper, um, can just find it here, was mentioned. And it's the paper that I <laughs> wrote myself. I don't mean to engage in too much self-promotion, but it's a paper. Maybe we can put it on, on the web page. I think we, we, we should do that. Plastic design of embedded retaining walls, where this, where this idea is, is actually described. Um, and if you, if you look at it from a kinematic point of view, the idea is that you have you have a different, you have all kinds of different possible failure modes. And depending on exactly what failure mode you, you let's say in an upper bound type calculation you assume, well, there is a, um, there is a moment and an anchor force that come with these different failure modes. So that means, uh, that means the, the idea was that, yeah, if you look at the design moment and it's called the design prop force here, on the other axis, we have um, an infinite number of combinations that satisfy the ULS requirements. Um, so A here corresponds to the case where we have uh, a very large, oh, not a very large, but a large prop force, and then the smallest possible moment that would typically correspond to a yield hinge forming in the, in the wall. Then we have the point B down here, which is the converse, the wall remains rigid, but the anchor yields. And then we have point C, which is somewhere in between, and what is what is optimal in any given situation, is of course uh, depends very much on, on the particular circumstances. And so, if you look, these these 
prop force versus the sine moment diagrams. So here's some examples as well. They, of course, also depend on the uh, embedment depth. So for a small embedment depth, you need more moment and more prop force. Whereas if you, um, if you increase the embedment depth, well, then both of these can, can be decreased. So your question is a really good and interesting one, but it's, it's not so easy to just give a, a one line uh, answer to. So, um, so, so uh, yeah, that's how it is. All right, Christian, maybe we should, uh, are we coming to an end here? I think so, yes. Okay, everybody. Uh, Thanks for, uh, thanks for listening in and staying so long in this webinar and uh, for the Q&A session, joining in with a lot of good questions. Uh, we have, oh, maybe there's, yeah, can I ask for an answer? Yeah, yeah that's just one last one here, I think. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, there's one. Uh, okay, I don't know. There's one here, Christian. She, this is a question directly to me. Maybe you can answer this. I'm just going to read it up. So, yeah. during during my previous design of prop retaining wall, I got unrealistically high prop forces and bending moments with Optum using lower bound and upper bound solutions. It was a good check for the stability of the whole system, but greatly over-designed the elements from structural point of view when cross-checked with other softwares. Could you comment on it, please? Any ideas where could be a mistake or a trick to make it work? Uh, well, I mean, my only comment on that is that um, I have a hard time taking that comment at face value uh, we have come, we have done extensive comparisons with other software packages for these types of, of problems as well, both finite elements and more sort of traditional limit equilibrium type programs. And so I'm, I'm very surprised to hear that. And I'd be very, very interested in actually getting that particular problem that we are, uh, that, you, that you're referring to and then see maybe something is wrong. Maybe something has been done in, in a slightly wrong way. Um, so I'm afraid I have to put this down to some uh, error some in, to do with user input um, because Optum is, is really an ideal tool for, for, for optimizing uh, these types of, of structures uh, and getting to actually very low bending moments and or uh, prop forces. So, yeah. um, so, so that would be really interesting if you could get in touch and, and share that uh, with us. Yeah, I think, I think Christian, maybe we should share, uh, we have these articles, comparisons with the spooks and plaxes that we could also uh, send out after the webinar. Sure. Uh, yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah, please send through and we'll have a look at it. And uh, so we have one, one webinar left this year and I think it's going to be on Optum G3. We'll post it soon and I hope, of course, you'll join again in uh, two weeks' time. But uh, thanks for now and uh, have a good day and see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, see you. Yeah, see you. Bye.